Okay, welcome back to Tabletop RPG Time, everybody. This week we're on the couch because all I'm doing is pulling from a deck of cards. Uh, we are... Ooh, stretching it out. Everybody welcome library, frequent guest of the stream. My, my, my favorite guest co-host. Magnus just looked at me so offended. Yeah, well, you don't come up here often enough to count as a co-host. You get to be a surprise guest. You say, yeah, okay, that's fair. But anyway, my favorite guest co-host here, Lever Cat. Yeah, I don't know about love you. I'm gonna eat this card, Dad. Okay, I can't eat the card. I'm gonna eat your toothbrush. Maybe don't eat my toothbrush, Kitty. That's not a good idea. Anyway. Today, we are going to be playing, uh, what's the name of this game? I have the idea of the game. Last Stop is what this is called. So this is a game where you tell a story about what goes by uh, while you're on a train trip. And I figured uh, that also is a pretty coherent experience uh, for someone driving like long trip. Like long haul driving. Sure, it's not exactly the same because you know with a with a train you get to kind of zone out a little more and pay a little better attention to the scenery, but it's the same sort of thing. And I thought it was a very good uh, opener to doing tabletop stuff again after having just driven uh, eight sixteen uh, thirty two hours. Or more, even, actually. Uh, to get to... Uh, to get to where I am right now. You know? So, uh, the core mechanic of the game is we shuffle this deck of cards, which I have already done. Uh, we shuffle this deck of cards, and then we divide it into three decks. And then you place the uh, end card, the Ace of Hearts, somewhere on in those three decks based on how long you want the game to be. Either you can place it on the bottom of the first third for a relatively short game, uh, or I guess on the top of the second third, you know, for a short game, uh, on top of the third third for a long game, or uh, in the middle of the second third for a uh, middling length game. And uh, I, I have done that, I have shuffled the cards, <laughs> This card won't matter. We won't ever reach it. Um, I have shuffled the cards. I have placed the Ace of Hearts based on how long I think I want this to be. And uh, we can just dive right in. We're pulling cards. I believe we can just dive right in. I don't think there's any setup scene other than you're on a train. Uh, you're about to set out on a long train journey. I'm reading for the rules now. Uh, you're about to set out on a long train journey. The deck represents that journey and the fleeting landscapes you glimpse as you pass them by. Remove the Ace of Hearts, uh, that's your destination. Place it within the journey deck based on how long you want it to take uh, to you, for you to get to your destination. Uh, once you are done, uh, draw a card. Uh, reveal new cards from the journey deck until you draw. Oh, okay. So once you have gotten everything set up, you discard. You draw the first card and say the corresponding prompt. You may then write as much or as little as you like about this step of your journey using the prompts as information. Uh, you may decide to answer the questions posed or may not to, whichever you prefer. Once you are done, discard the card and name a suit. So you pick a suit and then draw cards until you hit that suit, a joker or the ace of hearts. So I thought it was just draw from the deck. No, you name a suit and that's what, uh, that's what thing. You keep pulling until you meet that suit to kind of represent all the time that you're not necessarily paying attention. So I have removed the ace of hearts and we're going to put it uh, much further down in the deck, because I didn't know that. We're going to put it right about here, in comparison to it was about here, if that's obvious. It was about here-ish earlier, it's now about here-ish. 
uh, wow, that's really unclear. So it was it was in the top, it was right on top of the second third of the deck, and now it's uh, on the bottom of the second third of the deck. So other than that, we keep drawing until we find a card of that suit, a joker, or the ace of hearts, and we get there. Uh, when a joker is card, choose two cards from the discard pile and shuffle them into the top ten cards of the deck. Resolving a card you have written out bef uh, you have written about before gives you a glimpse of a place you thought you had left behind. So you draw. So essentially, when you draw a joker, you take two cards out of the cards you have actually written about, and uh, then they become a flashback again. Hi, library. Are you very excited about this game? I am. So let's get drawing. Uh, we draw our first card, which is the Queen of Hearts. I hope that's clear. And hi. Yes, hello. So we first pull, uh, based on the suit, that's the diamonds, the hearts, personal. Uh, the old flame. We had fun until we didn't. How did you meet? Why were you alike? Why didn't things work out? So we, as we are, uh, as we are leaving uh, our place where we are, uh, let's say we were in town for a convention, uh, a fan convention of some kind. Let's say a science fiction property. Uh, fill in your favorite science fiction property here. But we were in town for a science fiction property convention. And, um, as we are, you know, getting settled in on the, settled, settled in on the train platform, you know, getting settled into our seat, uh, double checking everything we have that we need for entertainment is with us. Uh, we just can't help but think about how, when we were first initially introduced to this show, that, uh, an old flame that got away... Uh, is who introduced us to it. And so it's kind of, you know, it's kind of nebulously tied to that person in our memory. Sure, we have plenty of memories without them in it about the show by now, but still there's that, there's always that little bit of a thumbprint of, oh, they introduced me to this. And that's, that's kind of where our mind casts backwards to, you know, uh, it casts backwards to long nights sitting on the couch, uh, binging this particular show. Uh, together, just kind of, you know, gasping at the twists we've already seen before and uh, debating whether that was a good play or whether it was just something that uh, that needed to happen to forward the story and who who belongs with who and that kind of thing. And uh, that's, that's definitely what's in the forefront of our mind as we hop back on this train or we hop on this train to head home after having spent the weekend here. And uh, I will name so I will name a suit based on what we need, what we want to pull here. So personal is hearts. Um, wonder about things is di is diamonds. So you see something wonderful and you're thinking about it. Um, urban, like literally urban. Uh, urban locations like a power plant or uh or a graffiti or some tower blocks you know that's the th that's one of the things you could see with clubs or uh spades are mysteries like things that don't make don't quite make sense you're like uh what what was here so i think we're gonna pull for spades next uh, and we're gonna pull we're gonna keep pulling until we don't until we see a spade that's not a spade that's a spade. Three of spades. That was pretty immediate. Uh, so three of spades. Mist. Impenetrable mists obscure all with the closest passing scenery. Where do you think you are? What can you just about make out in the gloom? What shifts just out of sight? So as we as we pull away, uh, we don't go far. Uh, the train has just barely gotten up to speed as we are sitting there kind of... Uh, keeping our eye out and it's it's been already pretty humid today uh, and so we're we're very thankful for the trains the air conditioning as we're sitting there and very suddenly as we are you know moving forward and getting up to speed uh, we find that a heavy mist descends upon the train 
and we kind of just look around like, ah, oh, I was hoping to look at the scenery, but all I'm getting is a big, is a big eyeful of mist. I guess I missed out on things. Uh, and we're just kind of like looking around and uh, very distantly in the vague, you know, by maybe because maybe enhanced by the vagueness of the mist, uh, we see, you know, a, a series of figures, you know, there's a there's a group of three people and they're walking and they have, you know, one of them has an umbrella and it's very clearly silhouetted. Uh, but we can't tell any more details about these people as we're going and we keep going and like there's this small uh, small plot that like the detail is all washed out of and we can't tell if it's some kind of abandoned uh, we can't tell if it's some kind of abandoned empty lot or if it's some kind of urban garden uh, either way the, the details of the plants in this place are uh, are all washed away uh, we see very distantly the shape of uh, we see through the fog the light of a, uh, a digitized billboard that just blinks rapidly into the fog. All we can tell is it's advertising something blue, and so on and so forth. We just kind of uh, sit there gliding along on the train, seeing just the faintest, uh, the faintest after images of what, uh, what's around and what's, what's nearby. And we kind of wish we could see a little more. And as we continue, uh, let's go with uh, let's go with clubs here. So we'll keep holding until we see clubs. So as we as we ride along, we kind of zone out a little bit and think about uh, oop. We kind of zone out a little bit and think about how uh, how things have gone. Okay, so these two cards, I just pulled the Joker. One, two, three, four, five. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So we will slide these in randomly, and we will have some reminiscence to. We will have some reminiscing to do. Um, as we ride along, the the fog starts to burn away. Uh, did we already pull the three of clubs? The three of clubs is fog, right? Yeah, the three of clubs is or no, three of spades is myth is fog. So we haven't pulled the three of clubs, but clubs is what we were waiting for. And the fog, as we're riding, the fog burns away, and we finally get to see something, anything. Uh, we just see uh, vibrant graffiti, words of protest writ large in a neon scrawl. Who wrote it? Is there any uh, trace of what was there before? Does the message resonate? So as we're riding. Uh, as we're riding along, we see uh, the fog burning away, and uh, somewhat off in the distance, we see uh, just a very simple graffiti tag of an upraised fist. And uh, we know that this could be any number of resistance movement these days. You know, it's a very powerful image to have an up an upheld fist. But uh, just as we're just as we're just as it's passing out of our sight, we finally process that around the upraised fist image, there is a braided there's there is a braiding vine around the fist, and we realize that this uh this upheld image is one of resistance against uh one of resistance against letting uh plants be where they should be and where they are intended to be. Uh, that sort of uh, guerrilla gardening thought, a sort of very solar punk image here, uh, in the sense that, you know, we, we kind of smile faintly as we're thinking about this and realize that this graffiti is intended to be uh, a, a rallying cry for a group of people who go around and sow seeds where there shouldn't be seeds and suggest that perhaps, uh, you know, gardening green spaces are something we need in our life. You know, it's worth growing food, even though we have some of the grocery store. And uh, it brings a little smile to our face because, you know, that's always something that's always something interesting to champion. And uh, this time we will wait for diamonds to, to see something wonderful as we as we hurriedly clack along, uh, almost immediately we see 
Uh, the monolith sky. Pillars of stone pierce the clouds, holding the very heavens in place. Who, if anyone, built them? What use may they have served long ago? Why do they all look the same? Okay. Uh, as we're as we are continuing to rattle along, we kind of pass out of the city limits, and uh, we pass by a familiar uh, a familiar modern art archive, uh, or rather, we we pass by a familiar piece of modern art. It's far from the first time that we've taken this train uh, into town and back home, and so we we see this mo we see this chunk of modern art uh, filling our vision pretty often um and it's titled the monolith sky and uh each monolith we know we've been there because we've seen it several times and went hmm and went there uh, we know that each monolith is delicately engraved with uh very complex scenes of various skies whether it's a you know blue comfortable cloud blue comfortable cloudless sky uh only implied by a few lines a few stray lines here and there or uh you know that that sky full of cotton ball clouds that you think of whenever s someone says a slightly cloudy sky or or a uh, a stark cold winter sky painted by thin lines of clouds that are more ice than water vapor and you know just various uh various cloud type textures uh, all throughout the but the one that we have uh stared at for the longest has definitely been uh the depiction of that gray steel uh winter sky just because the the delicate line work really implies that heavy cloud ceiling that you look up and see on a day that you wish you were doing anything but looking up to see this cloud ceiling there's something about the the way the lines trace across the stone that really just perfectly capture that sort of thing. And uh, it's not lost on you, the, the dual symbolism of the, each of these pillars, rec uh, you know, being recognizably detailed to look like a sky while also seeming to hold the sky itself up in some kind of outdoor amphitheater type situation. You know, each of these pillars holds up a little piece of the ceiling above it and uh, you, you've always wondered what it would be like to give a speech to a crowd gathered in, um, gathered in, uh, in amongst these pillars to feel like you are uh, on a stage set so broadly as to speak to nature itself. And uh, we will wait for... Uh, we'll wait for... We'll wait for spades again, something strange. So, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. And we, uh, as we're, as we're sitting around, you know, just thinking about this and that, we reflect back on the, uh, the Queen of Hearts. We reflect, we reflect back on, uh, that old flame we have uh we have left behind and just how much uh there was to show the world for them you know it, it, it's always it's always an easy date option to pick somewhere interesting and then go to dinner pick somewhere interesting to go and see together and then go to dinner afterward and talk about it and uh the pillars once again cast our mind backwards to this old flame because the first time we saw these pillars was with this old flame too uh because we were like i've seen this a thousand times on the way home on transit i need to know what these are and i want to show it to you <clears throat> or i and i want you to know what they are along with me and sure like we much like the show that we went to go uh participate with beforehand uh you know from the place we left uh we've been to these pillars a few times we even managed to uh catch the pillars on a day where someone was gearing up to give a speech but there was a whole counter protest movement that 
uh, got the law enforcement to sweep in and be like, you don't have a permit for this. We didn't get actually see anyone it speak. Uh, and so there are more memories than those tied to the old flame that we were leaving behind. Uh, but still, uh, their thumbprint is still deeply in our mind about this sort of thing. So we were waiting for spades, uh, the ace of spades, even. Uh, another mystery, as we uh, kind of snap out of our reverie, we realize that uh, we realize that the ace of spades is at the bottom and not the top of the charts. A uh, do Doppler, Doppier. It, it's supposed to say Doppelganger. But it just says Doppler, which is weird in the notes. Anyway, uh, the passenger down the aisle has your face. Are they wearing the same clothes? Do they acknowledge you? Where do they disembark? Uh, so as we kind of snap out of our reverie, we realize that as we were thinking about this old flame of ours, uh, we were unintentionally staring at someone, and uh, they kind of wave their hand at us, and we kind of snap out of it and go, Huh? Because they look a lot like us. And uh, you, you have that unparalleled... Uh, that unparalleled confusion uh, fill your mind as you realize this person is doesn't really look much like us in the face. But they're wearing the exact same outfit we are. You know, Maybe they were planning on uh, being in similar conditions to us. They have a lot of layers on. Uh, they have like a thick, they have like a thick leather, a heavy leather jacket, and then several layers of clothing beneath it, uh, of varying thickness. And uh, you can tell that, uh, you judging by the wad of clothing in their lap, uh, they also whatever they were doing was warmer than they were expecting, and so decided to take off several of their layers, and they're just kind of like. Uh, as we are processing all of this, they also kind of, like, process that we are wearing almost, almost exactly the same thing and kind of, like, look us up and down and just nod. They know that whatever we were preparing... They, they can tell that whatever we were preparing for, they were also uh, ready to handle whatever was coming at them well armored in a time well armored in a time when armor is not uh, usually worth much but better to be safe than sorry and uh, we will wait for another diamond i want something wondrous to happen so as we're going we rattle on looking away from the uh I believe the Three of Spades was a memory card, but we'll forget. We will allow that to pass on. Uh, as we as we look away from our doppelganger and uh, just kind of zone out for a while, looking out the window, we see uh, the glittering bay. Scattered sunlight twinkles like so many diamonds. We see that we have finally come around the curve, and. Uh, Filling the window is a bay so large that it, it is swallowed by the horizon. Uh, and we kind of smile. The bay has never been particularly safe to swim in for one reason or another. You know, some years, some years it's a current issue, some years it was pollution. But nowadays they've gotten it cleaned up enough that really, if you're a strong enough swimmer, you can hop in the bay and go for a swim. But it's usually not a good idea with all the all the very aggressive currents but it's still very pretty to look at you know the sun is starting to set as we are as we are heading toward home our destination and uh and it is angling off of the angling off the water uh giving us an almost uncomfortable glare but also painting the inside through the window of the train uh painting the inside of the area in this beautiful yellow gold light that uh, we can't help but smile as we look around and see it and uh, as we're sitting and musing about uh, how much we would love to have this sort of uh, honey gold light <laughs> uh, peruse its way through our life more often we see uh, 
a small, a, a relatively good sized fish leap out of the water after some unseen bug, and it uh, it also glints silver in the sunlight, uh, painted just the slightest bit yellow gold from the setting sun, and uh, we, we smile a little bit to ourselves at that. It's something that makes us wish we could paint to try and capture this image. And uh, we'll keep going. We will look for something. Uh, as we come around the bay, uh, we will come into another city, meaning we're getting a little closer to home, and we'll look for an urban environment. So that's clubs. But we won't see anything quite yet, but we will almost immediately, as we are coming into this uh, second city, which means we're getting closer to home, we will pull the Ace of Clubs, which means Metropolitan Commuters. They crawl over each other, a squirming hive of activity. Will you like them? What changed? Do you miss it? Um, so as we are continuing on, uh, we see... As we're continuing on, we come around the bay, and we come into the first stop after the bay. And uh, there is a large number of commuters also headed to their homes outside this second, slightly smaller city, uh, just piling into the train, uh, the half-empty half empty car we're sitting in goes goes from half empty to pretty much completely full uh it's a lot of people hurriedly checking their watches and you know scrolling on their phones and read some of them are reading uh books that they look very nervous about reading on the train uh someone is someone is looking down at their watch and mumbling very confusedly like i gotta have time i don't get it Oh, I'm not going to be home in time. I'm going to miss everything. Um, and we see we see uh, two parents having clearly having picked up their child from school and just kind of have the child in tow. And they all settle down, uh, the three of them. And uh, you see the the uh, you see one of the parents point out someone who's wearing their hair very dramatically, uh, although you're it, Although, given the direction they're pointing, you're not sure if they're pointing at the person with the very large, very pointy, elaborate mohawk, or the or the person who has their hair styled into some kind of very elaborate, space-age, curly-looking thing. Uh, but either way, they're pointing at the... Uh, you see them visibly point at this other passenger and say, Oh man, do you think it grew like that? to their kid and the kid kind of uh gives a little begrudging giggle uh clearly this is a running joke among this family and uh the uh the two punks with their very dr over dramatic hair kind of give a half-hearted smile uh they're they're clearly very excited to have someone pointing and talking about them in a positive manner for once instead of look at that delinquent over there i can't believe they pilfered all of my hydrogen tanks why did they do that you know and uh, one one of the punks uh kind of stands up out of their chair and approaches the family and says uh, and like kind of kneels down and looks at the small child and says do you like pins and the kid kind of nervously is hiding behind the other parent and the other parent kind of like scooches them back out it's like no no it's okay and the child goes um Yes, they're kind of my favorite thing. I collect them. And the the uh, the punk with the very tall mohawk kind of lights up at this and goes, You know, I um I I collect pins too. I mean and I I just I saw one on your bag and I had to know. Tell you what, I'll give you a little something to uh grow your collection a little further. And uh, as they're saying this and uh, kind of running a finger over their jacket to see which one of their pins is most appropriate for a small child to wear. Uh, we kind of we kind of take in a little more detail about the small child and the small child. Uh, you know they're dressed relatively comfortably in the local school's uniform. You know very, uh, very non nondescript white shirt and plaid uh, skirt. But on their school bag, there is a series of small pins. Uh, you see, like, a little ladybug buzzing around. And um, one of the pins... 
one of the pins clearly can move and it's a dial um that says fun from zero to ten and they have it set at about a five right now um there's another little pin of just a very excited looking little black cat shape um there's a fourth pin of just a little lemon and uh and if if as we're looking around uh at, like at, as we're observing the punk kind of trying to decide on a pin their eyes also settle on the little lemon pin and he go and, and he goes oh this is perfect and he plucks a little lime pin off of his jacket and you know fiddles with the backing a little bit and sticks it onto the onto the bag next to the lemon and goes there that'll work just fine won't you think and uh the, the punk smiles very broadly and uh gives the parents a little wave and walks away and the child is sitting there very starry eyed like just looking over at this punk so excited to have had a pleasant interaction with a stranger for once um let's pull for uh as we are pulling through the city we'll pull uh for another club and we immediately almost immediately after that punk kind of returns to their seat and everybody settles in and the train once again pulls away uh we see out the window <clears throat> what do we see crisscrossed canals clogged arteries green with algae uh as we are as we're pulling away uh we kind of the train tilts very slightly as it comes up over a bridge and uh, we look out the window and see uh, two canals crossing uh, beneath the bridge, one one heading toward the bay and one heading uh, one heading toward a river that's closer to home. Uh, and we can tell uh, you can tell which one's which because the uh, because the the water before it crosses on one side is very clearly much cleaner than after it interacts with the. Uh, after it interacts with the with the crossed canal from the bay, you can tell that the river is much cleaner, and then it interacts with the bay a little bit in this canal, and then and then is a little sullied as it goes on. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the bay, despite being much cleaner nowadays, uh, some of the tributary canals that people have dug off of it, uh, they haven't caught quite so much of the cleanup effort. People are still, you know, dumping things off the bridge. And we kind of wince. Uh, we, we, we take a little pull from a water bottle and uh, wince as we think about how much it takes to filter all that gunk out of even these man-made rivers, let alone the ones that are supposed to be there. Uh, and we'll wait for... Uh, let's wait for a heart. We haven't waited for a heart in a while. Let's keep pulling. That's a club. It's a diamond, and the wheels continue to clack under our feet as we as we continue to pull here. Finally, we get around to the. After a little while, we're uh, the city is getting a little thinner as we go, and uh, as we're approaching the edge of the city, we finally see out the window something to catch our eye: the four of hearts, the solitary church that marks the midpoint of the journey home. We are. Uh, we're about halfway home, and we know this because there is a single church in an area that is otherwise uh, just full of, you know, bars and arcades and nightclubs and just glowing neon signs for this, that, and the other, and ads plastered all over every surface that will hold still long enough to have an ad. But standing uh, unassailed by all of this, in the center of this district is an unremarkable little white church. Uh, it it went up there. It's probably been the building that's been in this district the longest. Uh, it went up there back before the city had you know subsumed this area. This used to be uh, the church that many people drove or you know found their way to every Sunday when this city was much much smaller. And uh, it shows because this is a very small chapel for the number of people that are come through here now. And uh, 
it's one of the few un, uh, uh, untagged buildings, one of the few places that is just itself and nothing more. Uh, there's a few stray people passing in and out of the doors every time we pass it. Uh, and it's really mostly remarkable for being something that is somewhere you can go for free in a place that is otherwise v very expensive and difficult on your wallet. Uh, and perhaps because it stands out like that is why we know that we are about halfway home. So we'll keep pulling. Let's pull for another personal card here, see if we can get a heart. And we're sitting here and we're thinking about how odd it is that this church has not gotten bought up by something corporate or, you know, paved over by this point. But, you know, such is fate. Sometimes things just go that way. And finally, we, uh, we see another thing that, that stirs our own mind. Ooh, the town you changed at on the way to Pride. Oh, this is very fun. There were other people doing the same. We could tell from the flags. Were you nervous? Who did you meet that you've stayed in contact with since? Do you still identify in the same way? I didn't know this was going to be a prompt. I'm very excited. So, uh, it's changed now. It used to be that this was the first town, you know, as we're, we go, we start going through a tunnel and we know that above our heads is, um, is the town that we first changed at for pride. Um, it's changed over the years. It used to be that this was the closest, this was the furthest place from the city that you knew it was safe to be out and proud about who you are. Uh, let's say at, at the time we were not sure of anything. You know, we were looking at ourselves in the mirror and not sure who we wanted to be anymore, but that wasn't something we could be safe with at home. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to go about this delicately because I, I only have experience with half of what I'm trying to say. Uh, you know what, let's retcon so I don't step in something that I should not have. Uh, at the time, we were not sure whether this fleeting attraction to uh, someone we should not have been, according to home, uh, was something worth indulging, expanding upon. But uh, one of our more sure-of-themselves friends, let's say, uh, talked us into going to Pride just to see what things were like at their most raucous, you know? And so we kind of, you know, hastily packed a bunch of things into a bag, uh, you know, mostly at the time in support of our friend who was identifying as bi at the time. Um, but, uh, and we were kind of, you know, in that big bubble of questioning at the time. And, uh, you know, we went to this very first Pride, and this was the first town that was really safe to change in, and, it, and that's where that friend lived. They don't live there now. They've moved several times, and it's been a long time since we've seen them, but uh, it's been a long time since we've seen that guy, but uh, we knew that his house was a safe spot to go, so we just told our parents, hey... I'm going over to this friend's house. Uh, we're probably just going to stay the night at his. You'll see me tomorrow. And our parents kind of, mm, okay, we're just glad you have friends, you know. Uh, and we packed all this buy stuff secretly into our bag uh, and uh, went to Pride. All uh, We got all decked out from the stuff in our bag. Uh, all decked out and went with this young man who, oops, uh, we didn't notice had a crush on us at the time. And, uh, he and our character had a really nice time at that very first pride. And, uh, lo and behold, eventually they, uh, the character settles on being by surprise. Uh, and you know, that friend 
who really introduced us to it all, slid from bi to gay, as a good deal of gay folks do. No, no shade there. You're go right ahead, but uh, it still sticks in our mind every time we go through this tunnel. Uh, we think about how now our hometown is is somewhere safe to be out and proud, even if you've got a shout down a few people sometimes at a bar it's still a heck of a lot safer than it had been but still this town holds that significance in our mind let's go for something a little lighter we'll, we'll pull for diamonds to see if we can get some wonder in our life so that's not a diamond that's not a diamond we're just sitting here thinking about how much we've changed as a person over time when we come up out of the tunnel and see uh, the Jack of Diamonds, the Pinprick City, a sprawling metropolis reduced to a single blip of light. Uh, so as we come up out of the tunnel, uh, there is a large mirror. Per perhaps it was initially placed as some kind of art project, but eventually when the, uh, when the rail system that we were, that we're taking home uh, was put in place, uh, it was realized that this large mirror had a uh, more metropolitan use, so to speak, uh, in letting the train, letting the train operators see what's going on in the tunnel as they come up out of it or come down toward it. And uh, in this, in the at the very top rim of this large mirror, there is a single pin prick, pin prick of light that we know is the city we have left behind uh, for that convention that we were just at. And it's always so interesting to try and spot this little pin prick of light among the cacophony of everything else in the mirror uh, that we just barely spot as we come up out of the tunnel. And every time we, uh, we try to put our thumb over that little pin prick of light, and sometimes we're successful and sometimes we're not, uh, but it kind of springs from an old, an old tradition from that friend who lived in the tunnel, uh, the the town that was tunneled under. Um, uh, he 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 had, uh, he had one time. Uh, he had had an awful migraine going, and he was like, "Oh, can you? This is a weird ask, man. But can you? Can you cover the little?" dot of light from the city I, I know this is weirdly specific but i swear every time it gets me in the eyes and so that first time we, we put our thumb over the over the light for him and he kind of breathed a sigh of relief and ever since uh you know we, we've done that every time every time we come up out of the tunnel uh we try to get our thumb in the way fast enough so we don't see it for more than just a scant moment and uh we're so lost in our memory that we almost forget to put up our thumb fast enough and we just barely get it into place uh, before it uh, fades out of our view as we whip by this mirror and uh, we're coming into another city so we will wait for a spade not a spade and we're thinking about how all the weird little traditions that you develop, uh, you know, living your life, uh, stick to you when we see the Jack of Spades. Wait. Yeah, the Jack. Oh, wait, no. Uh, uh, this is the mystery. I lied. We're, we're kind of sitting here lost in thought. And uh, for once, the conductor comes around to check our tickets. Uh, usually the conductor doesn't bother with checking tickets because this line is so, uh, is really just commuters and most commuters already have their tickets, but, uh, something about tonight, uh, maybe it's the convention, maybe it's, it's the fact that there's a lot of people leaving the convention hall at the same time as these commuters, but, uh, the conductor <clears throat> almost doesn't stand out for a long moment because there's you know, various costumed bodies in the, uh, wandering about in the train car. So it takes you a long moment for, to recognize him as an, as a, you know, employee of the transit, uh, 
transit regulator. You know, you, you think for just a moment he's just kind of a, a, a cosplayer who's still stuck on, you know, uh, and then he's like, uh, ticket, please. And you're like, uh, uh, ticket, please. And you, uh, 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 kind of slap all of her pockets and eventually manage to worm out her phone and show a little, a little check mark on the little ticket app. And he kind of nods and carries on, uh, continuing to check all the other people's tickets you know slowly down the course of the train and uh you know it's it's kind of interesting how normally he stands out like a sore thumb in his transit uniform but on a night like tonight uh he just looks like another member of the crowd okay let's wait let's wait for let's wait for another little wonder let's wait for a diamond we kind of sit back the uh we sit back for a moment the the conductor handled and almost immediately see um if i can find it in the thing the patchwork meadows quilted fields green yellow and every shade in between uh we're, we're getting closer and closer to home as we roll on and uh one sign that we know that we're getting much closer to home is now instead of coming up into a city we come into uh, a series of flower farms you know it, it's cha it changes practically every year what flowers are growing in here uh what what flowers are growing where in here but it's always seems to be uh, a little group of lavender and uh lavender and tulips and various other bulbed flowers uh rotating different colors different shades different varieties every year but there's always that uh purple there's always that lavender field uh filling the area trying to attract as many bees as possible to these these bulb plants uh that may not always attract the most uh effective pollinators and uh you know, it kind of makes us smile that knowing that just not so far from home, there's this little flower farm. They don't, they they have never done a public tour. It's always been just kind of a, a, a business that exists, a little farming area that brings some color to an otherwise uh, very just the same dark green cash crop area. And we we will keep pulling, waiting for a club for real this time. But before we do, we pull the Ace of Hearts. And uh, we pull into the stop that means home. Uh, and we kind of heave a sigh of relief. It's been... Uh, it's been a relatively eventful ride home. You know, normally... Is it's very easy to just kind of uh, pick up a pick up a phone or shove some earbuds in or you know pick up a book or pick up a game and just uh, not think about anything on the way home. Just kind of let the train take us home and listen for that last uh, for that uh, announcement stating that this is a second to, second to last stop on the line. Uh, you know, you have here or the next place to get off, uh, and we kind of mouth the mouth the way the announcer says it uh, under our breath uh, as we're kind of hurriedly packing uh, a small sketchbook and you know a couple other various things into our bag, uh, unheedingly uh, having doodled the whole bunch as we've gone along. Uh, and we realized that, you know, this was a much more thoughtful experience than the just kind of zoning out and letting the train take us where we needed to go uh, that we're much that we're used to. And it was kind of nice to have uh, have a little moment's reflection before we got home, uh, before everything uh, before everything was under under our control again. Uh, and it was it was nice and we should really definitely do this more often just kind of let our mind wander around you know to think about uh, to see the little moments like the the punk lending that pin or uh you know think about where 
how much of our life has been spent seeing places from this train, you know, how important, uh, little important moments of beauty, like that little, uh, that little fish jumping out of the sun-soaked bay, and, you know, thinking about the little weird traditions we have, and how important people that were previously just such a major fixture, fixture in our life are there no longer, uh, but they still left their mark indelibly, importantly, on our lives. And uh, it's nice to occasionally look back while we are thinking about things, rather than just finding ourselves one place and then finding ourselves another. It makes for a creative outlet, so to speak or those nostalgic thoughts that otherwise just pin us to a keyboard and have us writing story after story about characters we characters we've written about so much their well-worn grooves in the keyboard by this point you know anyway that was uh that was our little journey with last stop uh I really liked that. I liked the mechanic kind of reflecting the passage of time uh, so realistically in, you know, a train journey. I like that you you declare a suit and you just wait around until that suit uh, wait around until that suit comes up. It's kind of it's it's very evocative of how the mind just sort of wanders uneventfully for a while when you're on a long trip like this you know uh i don't know i thought it was a great time uh do i have any more that are just cards that i'm feeling uh not really i could go grab my dice or i could do a lost and found do we have time for a lost and found we don't we have another hour uh, we don't have time for another Lost and Found, but uh, we do have time for me to grab my dice and pick up another game. Uh, if you're willing to bear with me on some setup, we could run a card a game, or... You know what? Uh, we said we were going to come back to Beyond Super. Do I need dice for Beyond Super for the optional rules? We said we were going to come back to Beyond Super. We could. Or we could stay on theme with, uh, you know, that theme of coming home. We could play uh, another game called Singo. Singo? It's got like a little umlaut, so it's like Singo. Uh, it's kind of. Mm, I don't want to play that one right this second. I do want to play it, it sounds really good. But, uh, let's, you know, I said we were going to come back to Beyond Super, but that there's a lot to do there, uh, and it's true. We were going to come back to Beyond Super. I think we should do that. So let me put up the BRB text real quick, and I'm going to go grab my dice. So we can play Beyond Super with the optional rules, shall we? Dice, 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 my darling. Where are they? These are the correct ones. I don't. I didn't hear anything, so I don't think we missed anything. Uh, let me maybe update the title real quick while I'm at it. Uh, let me. Mm. While I got the text up, let me grab some water. I have been trying very hard to be very good about my hydration as of late. Uh, 
<laughs> I was not very good about my hydration uh, for the second month I was gone. I will put it that way. And so now I am very specifically aware of, man, I haven't been drinking any water. <laughs> oh. So let me update my title here. Because we are now playing Beyond Super. Uh, let me tell a few people that... Let's tell Twitter. Let's tell Twitter that we have switched over to Beyond Super. Okay, uh, let's give some, pe give some people some time, uh, and while I wait, I'm going to talk about uh, how I felt about the game we just played. Oh, man, everybody's live tonight. I'm, like, looking at my Twitch app, because I was like, oh, man, I haven't, uh, I haven't checked any of, any of my anythings. Oh, cool. A spam bot blocked spam bye now um yeah there's a lot of people live tonight uh jubilee ob is live a uh, fellow member of the codex who is a reading stream group i do but i don't have to mention tonight so i'm gonna leave that for if you like reading streams show up on a paper cuts night and you'll find out what paper cut or and you'll find out what the codex is I'm glad Jubilee is back. Uh, she's been juggling a lot of personal lives. Uh, Brother Kyo is also live. We might go say hi. He's likely to stream a lot longer than I do. So is Kyle. Anyway, now that I, I, I've rattled on uh, about Twitch enough, uh, the game I was playing, I really, really like that the mechanics kind of feed into the story uh, with the game we were just playing that I have already last stop why did I just like my brain like immediately went oh yeah this is the train game you don't need the name of it no nah, it's just the train game um, I really like I really like the way last stop uh, kind of you know it, it's far from the only game where you pull cars from a deck to uh, let me get rid of that be right back text because I'm actually sitting here let me let me adjust the camera just a smidgen. It's felt a little high all night. There we go. Whoop. Anyway, um, yeah, last stop. Uh, it's far from the only game where you kind of just pull cards out of a deck until you meet a certain card to, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> it's far from the only game where you just pull cards for a, uh, for a prompt uh, until you hit a certain card and then you're done. Uh, but I really like the uh, I really like the mechanic of the Jokers uh, being in the deck and potentially just making you reflect on certain cards. Uh, I really kind of I should have noted what cards we were looking for so we could have reminisced a little further. But like. I, I like that you can wander back to an existing prompt that you've already kind of exposited on and think on it a little further and a little far and a little harder. Uh, I think that's super cool. I think it's super fun. Uh, and I really like that the way the way that the mechanic feeds into the emotion, uh, the emotionality of the story and that, you know, 
I don't know if any of you have been on, like, a relatively long, like, road trip or train trip or something, uh, but especially when someone else is driving, it's very easy to just stop what you're doing and look out the window and let your brain just... for a while. Uh, and even when you're driving, honestly, if there's nothing too much happening, it's, it's very... it is, in fact, dangerously easy to stop thinking. You know, that's how a lot of these highway accidents happen. It's just someone stops thinking for a little too long and then things change a little too quickly and they're out of luck. Uh, so I really like that you just say, all right, the next thing my brain is going to encounter is this category. And then you just keep pulling cards for an arbitrary amount of time. Like if I would have said, you know, each, each time there's a one in four chance that you're going to pull what you're looking for. And, uh, so that kind of emulates that sense of the mind wandering for a long time. Uh, but also, it it allows you to almost immediately jump to your next prompt, and you can say, I'm sick of, you know, it. it is a very specific strength of this game that you can say, I'm sick of answering personal questions about my character, we're going to look for scenery next, or we're going to look for something weird next, or we're going to look for, mm, you know, this, that, or the other next. Uh, I think, you know, going about it in that specific way does not suit every system, but I think some systems would really benefit from that kind of thing. You know, think back to playing even just Go Alone, for example. We sat there and we pulled nothing but uh, stuff about the weapon, the weapon, the weapon, the weapon. We had pulled nothing about the wielder basically practically the whole game and i don't know if this would apply very well to uh wretched and alone i think you could apply it to a wretched and alone if the wretched and alone is about handling slightly long periods of solitude you could do like a wretched and alone about like trying to survive mentally the difficulty of waiting out light speed journeys for messages from home maybe and you could do something like that you could say all right the next message from home is going to be about something has changed with the family and then you draw and you draw and you draw and you draw and how many cards you draw it affects how much how long you're alone and so how much you have to interact with the tower maybe but that's just one thought, you know, the way that Last Stop really does that, it, it's not a consequence to draw too many cards, but it is definitely, like, the only consequence of drawing too many cards is the story will come to an end a little earlier. Oh no. You know, you know what the end point is, and you know where the end point is, and I don't know, I just really... Like, as soon as I understood that mechanic, I was like, that's genius, because it, it immediately ties the mechanics to the setting and makes them one and the same. Which is something that uh, some of these games, uh, especially some that I have planned coming forward, uh, they kind of forget. They, get, they either get so bound up in the mechanics and the gameplay that they stop letting you tell a story, like Crypt Keeper. They're still going to be really fun, but they're not going to be as aggressively focused on telling the story. It's more about, I am playing this solitaire minigame with myself, so to speak. And, uh, I don't know. I just, I really liked Last Stop. Uh, it, the rulebook itself is just plain text with, uh... Like, it's well-organized plain text, and it's got, like, you know, nice tables for each of the... Oh, excuse me. Each of the prompts. But it could do with a little key art. You know, like, one out front, one out back, even. And, like, maybe color the, uh... You know, you could color the main rules text to look a little bit more like a transit map. And then just have, like... I'm sure there are certain, like, subway maps that are, uh you know, free for commercial use or something. Or you could license, like, a fake subway map 
for out front and a different fake subway map for out back. You know, you, but that's just, that's optional. You know, the game plays very well. That's just something to get people's eyes on your game. I really liked Last Stop. I thought it was a great time. And I think I've rattled on long enough uh, so that I can give people a little bit of time to show up and want to listen to superhero things. Uh, but I did want to give my piece on uh, EBBBB. Uh, I wanted to give my piece on Last Stop because I thought it was really good. Okay. So we need a six-sided die for the goodwill rules. And that's it? Really? That's it? Okay. Uh, once again, with Beyond Super, your after-hours job refers, refers to superhero work. Uh, the jokers are optional, so I will leave them in. My option is yes. Uh, and while I shuffle, we can go over how to play. So we will go through character creation first, obviously. I will be working in the same world as uh, the Electron. So uh, if you weren't around for that, it's kind of a 90s, 2000s era comics. Uh, 90s, 2000s era city. Uh the only there are a almost oversaturated volume wow that completely missed there's an almost oversaturated volume of heroes throughout the world and uh we'll go we'll be working in another city separate from uh where the electron is this time uh so don't worry you won't need any of that uh any of that canon beyond uh beyond the fact that the Electron accidentally deleted everybody's superpowers, and that will probably be the end of the story uh, for this character, too. Uh, but we'll see where the world takes us. Perhaps it will turn into something else. Uh, we generate this character, we generate the world in which they live, and then uh, we draw an event card... Uh, and then, based on that event card's prompt, we take one of one, two, three, four, five actions, and then we interpret the prompt based on our action that we're taking. So, like, one of the actions is make a promise you won't keep. So, like, what if one of the prompts says, oh, yeah, go on a date? Oh, we will make a promise we can't keep to go on a date, and it, we just... <laughs> you know, uh, usually it's our after hours job, uh, aka our time in the math, that, wow, I'm really off of it today on shuffling. I'm sorry. Uh, but usually it's our after hours job that conflicts, as is tradition in these superhero stories. So the cards are all shuffled. Let's read the optional rules because we kind of glazed over them last time. So. After we create a world, uh, we've we've already said that the heroes, you know, we've we've got the world built. Uh, the character creation. So when creating a character, the following basic assumptions are made: your after hours job is routine. You're not a new hero. You're barely getting by financially. The general mood is <laughs> melancholic, and there are issues with your day job. So it's not like you know you love your job or anything. And uh, your after-hours job is straining your relationship with your loved ones. Uh, so we pick... To create a character, split the deck of cards into its four suits, then draw one card from each suit and interpret them using the prompts associated with the card. We draw a complication, our day job, a superpower, and an origin. We forgot to do that. So I'm just going to draw the Nine of Hearts for our origin and then i'm going to keep going until i get the next card we need uh our club uh, the, the jack of clubs for a day job uh the nine of spades for a complication and 
the uh, Jack of Diamonds for our power. And that's really good. Those were really good pulls, so now I only know what two cards are, and now I'm not going to know where they are because I'm putting them back on the deck. Okay. So, first up, our complication is the Nine of Spades. So who's this? Who's this character? Uh, optional rules. Playing with jokers is an optional rule. Uh, add one joker to the complication cards and one of the or origin cards. If you draw the joker during character creation, your character is a supervillain instead of a superhero. You also draw an additional card from either the complications or origins. Uh, okay, so we didn't draw a joker. Uh, so we are not a supervillain. So if we draw a joker during our turn, immediately draw another card. The result of this card and your action is the worst possible outcome for the given action. So if we ever draw a joker, we draw again, and the prompt goes horribly. Noted. Uh, choice. You may draw two event cards on your turns. On each of your turns, uh, pick one, discard the other. Shorter game, more control. That's no fun. Anyway, uh, there's a bunch of descriptor tables and stuff. Uh, we'll get back to the goodwill rules. I will... Okay. So, complications. Come on. Where are the character creation tools? Ah, here are the character creation tools. Tables. So the Jack of Clubs means our day job is a cab driver or coach person. Okay, so we're a cab driver. We're a cabbie. We'll shove that back in the deck. And our origin is the Nine of Hearts, which means you felt like the things you were doing to help weren't enough. So, you know, as a cab driver, we were like, uh, you know, spotting people fares every now and again. It's like, meh, meh. Uh, but that didn't feel like it was enough. Our power is the Jack of Diamonds, an elemental power. And uh, one day during a heat wave, we feel like we're not doing enough. And uh, we help somebody who is kind of down on their luck uh we just say hey uh listen as long as you don't care where you're going i won't turn the meter on uh i can bring you back here or i can talk another cab into bringing you back here you look like you need some ac buddy come sit in the cab and so this person kind of just hung out in our cab and cooled off and but and when they cooled off uh and we brought them back to their you know spot Surprise, it was revealed they were a, uh, what's, uh, did it just say elements? Yeah, elements. Uh, so it didn't say, so it's an elemental power. Let's give them, uh, wind powers. Uh, they said, listen, don't tell anybody, but I used to be a wizard, and I got just enough hits to give you something for letting me cool off. So now you have control over breezes. Boop. And we were like, Bzzz. you know, magic taser our body. And uh, lo and behold, we have control over the wind. Uh, last but not least is our complication. Someone is blackmailing you. Uh, so unfortunately, because that happened in a public cab, uh, almost immediately, someone learned uh, who we are and why uh, and why we had control over the wind, and so they are constantly uh, threatening to leak the information that this wizard gave us our powers and uh, who this wizard is, and we know that if the wizard's identity were to be leaked to the public. Uh, it just wouldn't end well. Everything would be awful. Especially for the poor wizard who would have very suddenly a 
large, massive group of people. Hi, library. A large, massive group of people hounding him to give them superpowers, and he doesn't want that. And we don't want that for him either, so we're kind of uh, in, a, in a very inconvenient blackmail situation. No, library, you can't eat the dice. Uh, we're very we're in a very inconvenient blackmail situation, which is especially inconvenient because we drive a cab for our job, which doesn't make for a lot of money. So let's write this down. Uh, we are a cab driver. We're a cab driver who has wind powers. Uh who is being blackmailed by someone who photographed our origin, which was a wizard spending his last spell on us to give us wind powers. Cool. Uh, and we are, I'm not going to say we're in the same city. We're just in like another, we are in another slightly larger city that constantly has cab traffic. Uh, and we'll pull for events later. Now let's scroll back up. Now that we've uh, created our character. Oh, hi library. Library's very invested in the dice. Goodwill. Goodwill is an optional rule that adds more mechanics to the process of writing your character's story. When asking another character to do something, roll a six-sided die and add your goodwill to the result. Your goodwill is a numeric value between plus two and minus two. Represents how likely people are to help you out or listen to you. Every time you let a character down, reduce your goodwill by one down to a minimum of minus two. Every time you help someone out or sacrifice something to be there for them, increase your goodwill by one while your cat tries to eat the dice. Uh, up to a maximum of two. Uh, after rolling, interpret your result as the other character's response. Uh, negative one to zero, no, and something goes wrong. One to three, just no. Uh, four to five, yes, but you need to do another thing. Uh, six is yes, and on a six plus, they will yes, and I'll do this other thing for you. Goodwill may also be used as currency to push the result of an event. Uh, Keeping track is still an optional... Uh, you can counter cards. Huh. Well, that's, um... That's a process. No. Uh, connections... Is another optional rule that I'm going to ignore. So we'll just do Goodwill. I've kind of gotten... I've lost my brain here. Where was I? Character creation. Oh, okay, the card values are for, like, the countering rule. But I don't like the countering rule, so that's boring. Uh, okay, so let's actually make our character now, now that we have uh, a grasp on everything. Uh, so, in short, once again, uh, we will be drawing cards from the deck that will give us prompts, and then we have actions we can take in regards to those prompts that inform how the prompt goes and every time we let someone down we lose goodwill and every time we fulfill a promise uh we will gain goodwill but we have to roll goodwill to see how people respond if we're asking something of them so what's our superhero name what's our regular name i think our superhero name is 
I'm I'm a big sucker for single word names. So our name is Gust. Uh and I think this character is going to be kind of a little bit minimum subtlety about his identity, even despite everything. Because he didn't think uh he didn't think he was gonna be blackmailed when he made his hero name. So he go he is Gust Augustus. So Augustus Gust. Augustus Gust, uh, what's a good A last name? See, I'm already using Armstrong for a D and D character I'm playing, and I don't want to get confused. Armstrong, uh, let's go Argento. Is that a real last name? No. But it's a superhero as heck last name. So we're playing as Augustus Gu Augustus Gust Argentum. Uh, our rival is an arch nemesis or our our arch nemesis and coworker we can't stand. Uh, so someone else has the opposite of wind powers. You know what? Let's let's have some fun with it. Uh, it is a pollution themed villain called uh, it's a pollution themed villain called uh, Ozone. Um, and what's their name? Let's have it be similarly alliterative. Uh. Ozone, aka Triple O, uh, is Orville Ozone. Uh, what's a good, what's a good O last name that's very comic booky? Uh, orange. Let's go with the color theme. Orange. Uh no, I lie. And you know what? No, that's that's pretty comic books. I'll I'll do that. That's not like a real person's last name. I say as if there's not someone named like of orange that kind of just devolved into orange. Ooh, uh Again, that's not a last name, that's an item description, Organistrum. Uh, is like another word for word for a hurdy gurdy. No, we're gonna stick with orange. So our our villain is Orville Ozone Orange, and uh, their whole shtick is uh, they're a pollution themed villain. So they commit you know various crimes to make people aware of climate change. Uh, our friend is a uh, Bud. Ooh, what's a good B last name? That's very comic books. Something snappy, bud. Uh, bud Brittle. <laughs> yeah, we're going. We're these names are a little more. Uh, these names are a little more golden age than silver age, or rather, these these names are a little more golden age than uh, bronze age comics. But I'm down for that, you know? Uh, sometimes that just happens. So Bud Brittle is our best friend. Uh, we don't know his first name. We just always called him Bud. Uh, our look in costume... Uh, I think our look in costume is kind of akin to uh, what people expect out of like a, like a cloud demon so to speak you know it's just very like lots of flowing fabric it's it's like a it's obviously like a bright white cape and like there's a there's a um there's like a little three curly lines breeze motif on our chest and uh, it's all very like loose flowy fabric that really reacts to our powers uh in costume 
And uh, out of costume, we're just dressed like... We're dressed in like an old faded uh, super pop t-shirt. Because of course there are, t are superheroes who were also pop stars. Uh, we're faded. We're, we're dressed in like an old faded uh, super group, literally super group uh, t-shirt. Um, our little cabbie's hat and uh, just a pair of like comfortable pants. Honestly, like none of our passengers ever see our legs, so they might as well be sweatpants. Uh, Oh, I, I need to write that down. So, costume is... Flowy fabrics... Think... Stereotypical... Cloud... Nymph... Vibes... Or, like, cloud... Cloud spirit vibes... Done up in whites and grays, and are uh, with a three curly lines breeze logo on the chest. Sorry, I'm spending way too long on character creation, as is tradition around here. Uh, but I've got a whole hour. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> And our normal clothes is faded, super group t-shirt. We loved super pop before getting our powers. And comfy sweatpants. Since our customers don't see our legs. Uh. Contacts. Two people or groups you work with. Uh. I would say... We work with, uh, let's stick this guy in the Bay Area, and, uh, one of the, one of the Bay Area's teams that we've established from, uh, working with the, with, with the Electron was, like, a team of former sidekicks that, the, that I definitely remember the name of. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, I definitely remember uh this 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 team of former sidekicks wait no this is someone we have to i have to remember because it's someone that comes up a lot in the story um i wish i remember what i named those those teens uh god we could just stick them in a different city and have it be a different uh team of sidekicks you know what? No, uh, I have a better idea. Uh, he works in he works in a different city than the Bay Area. We will just definitively say that. And uh, one of the people he works with is uh, the Fist, whose whole shtick is he's just good at martial arts. He doesn't have any powers. He doesn't have any fancy equipment. He just is the Fist. And the Fist likes to talk about himself in the third person. The Fist thinks it's a great idea to sell this merchandise. The Fist thinks this villain is not worth their time. Uh, so along with the Fist, we have uh, a civilian contact.
and our civilian contact, uh, Charlie, um, Charlie Copper. Let's, let's lean in on the color names. <laughs> Who's a beat cop? He was like, well, my name's Copper, so... And Officer Charlie Copper, who's how we hear which, uh, which crimes are worth going to investigate. That's right. His name's Charlie Copper. He's a cop. Uh, weaknesses. How can others take advantage of our weaknesses? What are we bad at? Uh, so, obviously, uh, a big weakness of ours is if there's too much wind already, uh, we can only go with the direction of the main wind. So, our, our biggest weakness is, ironically, bad weather. makes our powers very directional. Uh, you know, we can we can build off of existing wind, but we can't build wind in the opposite direction of the existing wind. And we deal with cab customers all day, so we're just very blunt. It's like you have to interact with people so much being a cab driver uh so it's just like you're just very like i'm out of social energy i don't want to deal with this okay uh so we start with zero goodwill so let's note that currently zero goodwill And uh, let's start pulling cards, shall we? Optional rules, not something I want. Okay. Let's pull for events. Because I shuffled these, right? Let's shuffle these uh, once or twice more, just for safety. Wow, did you all just watch that work and then undo itself? Because I sure did. God dang it, these were nicely shuffled. It's fine. Everything's fine. I can shuffle cards. I definitely know what I'm doing. Okay, let's pull for events, shall we? So the Seven of Clubs. Uh, a reporter wants to interview our persona. Didn't we pull this super early for the Electron as well? Uh, so we are sitting in... Uh, well, what action do we want to take in regards to this? So we're sitting in our cab, and we're... Uh, we're, you know, picking up somebody from a hotel that wants to go to the airport, and they're like, Hey, uh, you know, not to talk to you while you're driving, and, uh, not to talk to you while you're driving, and we go, yeah, yeah, uh, please don't talk to me while I'm driving, I'm very, very busy, and it's like, <laughs> you know, yeah, not to, t but, uh, did you, did you hear this reporter is, uh, so insistent that he's gonna get a review with the gust, and, uh, unthinkingly we slam on the brakes, and everybody's, like, the, the guy who was sipping a latte, like, he drops his latte all over the back of our head, and, and we're like, oh! And he goes, oh, jeez, oh, gosh, I'm sorry. Um... Yeah. 
you know, I should really clean that up for you. And he goes, no, no, it's fine. Don't worry about it. It's not the first latte I've got thrown at me today. Uh, but you said this, uh, this reporter type wants to interview the ghost, huh? He's a real local celebrity, you know. And, uh... You in the little rear view mirror, we see the passenger kind of roll their eyes and go, "Yeah, tell me about it." I I've always preferred the electron, but you know, uh, the ghost has his moments. And we go, "Oh yeah, well, uh, you know, I hear he keeps the crime rate down pretty low around here." And the uh, the the passenger goes, "Oh, this is my stop. Thank you." Uh, before saying anything else, and grabs his stuff and leaves. And we're sitting there looking in the rearview mirror and realize that we gotta address this uh, reporter wanting to talk to us in costume. Thanks, for me. <laughs> Thankfully, uh, we... We do not need uh, to have any, you know, since we own our cab ourselves, we don't need to have any alibi. But, uh, we're gonna make a discovery in uh we're gonna make a discovery in doing this interview and uh that discovery is that um our good buddy bud brittle uh works uh we've never really talked to bud about uh we've never really talked to bud about or wait no bud brittle uh is Bud Brittle also? Yeah, Bud Brittle is also the Oz is, is also Ozone. I forgot. Uh, so we're talking, and uh, we're talking to this reporter, and uh, we realize in the process uh, of getting around and talking to this reporter that Bud Brittle works for the same paper, and uh, the the. Unfortunately, Bud Brittle knows uh, our secret identity, and so if Bud hears our uh, description and finds that it matches too well with the Gus in costume and, you know, uh, Augustus out of costume, because he knows it's as Augustus, uh... Because he moonlights in this, uh, you know, between articles, he's he's a, he's a part-time cabbie, but uh, so he's a co-worker. But anyway, uh, or uh, Bud Brittle. Wait a minute. No, my brain's smooth tonight. I'm sorry. Who Bud Brittle? Who Bud Brittle? My brain's smooth no, our buddy is Bud Brittle. That's why his name's Bud Brittle. Is it Oroville is the co-worker. Anyway, our buddy Bud Brittle uh, turns out to be... Working for a... Rival paper. So, our buddy Bud Brittle uh, turns out to be working for a rival paper to this... Uh, to the paper that this reporter is trying to get her, uh, an interview with us for and so in the process of doing this interview it is revealed that uh bud really could use that scoop and he kind of gets a little jealous with us and uh we kind of ask him to hush up and not ask for an interview as well because uh we're not very good at talking in costume uh. You know what, folks? Uh, I think we're going to sit on this character. I'm sorry, that yawn just made very clear to me that I'm kind of sleepy. I'm kind of snoozy. And I want to do, uh, I want to do Augustus justice. I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to be the one, I don't want to give him a half-asleep story. And we're already almost out of time anyway so uh i want to cut it a little short i'm just i'm sleepy i want snooze uh we'll come back to we will be coming back to augustus and uh 
when we do come back to Augustus, I will be prepared for it. And uh, he will actually be in the Bay Area. And uh, one of his contacts, along with the Fist, will be uh, that sidekick team. Promise. And y'all gotta hold me to that sometime. But I'm sleepy. I'm tired. I'm snoozy. Uh, I just had Magnus sneeze all over my leg. So... <laughs> I hate to cut it so short, but these are the short these are the short stream nights anyway. We will be coming back to Gus Augustus. Uh This has been tabletop RPG time. I certainly had a time. I don't know about you. I liked last stop. Uh we'll come back to Augustus uh and play more beyond super later. Uh I hope you all have a great week. Uh, tune in for Paper Cuts on Friday. Uh, we will be doing. We will be reading the Siege of Dracula's Castle from Dracula. That's just where we are in the book. We'll be finishing up Dracula this later this week. So if you really wanted to catch some of Dracula live, the end of to, uh, the uh, the Friday is the only time you're gonna have to do so. Uh, we we'll play in another tabletop RPG. I have something on deck, but I don't know if I am feeling confident enough to do it. It's kind of it's drawing based, and I don't know if I'm feeling confident enough to do it. I might wind up just playing Bum uh, Bumble instead. Uh, but either way, uh, I hope you all have a great week. Uh, I really enjoyed uh playing last stop and i'm looking forward to learning about augustus uh i may just play him off i might just play it off stream and like do a recorded video about it just kind of like as an opener to the whole uh cinematic universe pro uh concept like kind of just cut down the highlights out of the electron or like re like do like a scripted thing based on the electron that we already did and then play like an edited game of uh beyond super i don't know we'll see i'll i don't know if it has to be live we'll we'll cross that bridge when we get there i'm running out of steam have a great week everybody mm -hmm.